One of the most complicated things on a locomotive is naturally the thing that delivers the power to the wheels. The piston and the cylinders and the valve here that you might call the brain of the engine. There's a lot of different types of valve gear. The valve gears are levers in operation or eccentrics. Some people call them cams, eccentrics, which do the simple job of sliding a piece of metal back and forth over a port. I will show you what happens in the port. As soon as I can find my stuff here. This is a very crude section of a steam chest. Now, do you all know what a section is? Well, it's a, it's a drafting feature that engineers and draftsmen use when they want to show you the inside of something. They take an imaginary knife and chop down through the center of it and give you a bunch of little diagonal lines and say, well, this is like we chopped down through the center of it. This little thing here is known as a D slide valve. I'm not quite sure why it's called a D because that doesn't really look like a letter D unless you put it up against something like this. So we'll call it a letter D like everybody else does. This is a steam port. It's a slot, runs crossways like this. This is a steam port too. It's a slot that runs crossways like this. This is an exhaust steam port. This is also a slot which runs crossways like this. This is a flat valve which has space this way, and the ends are closed off too. This is a hollow cavity. Now, you can see that if we move this thing this way, this area that's covered in here with steam under pressure, the steam is going to go in the obvious place, down through this hole. And it goes down into the piston and pushes the piston to one end. <coughs> now, at the same time, that's happening. At the same time that's happening, there is either air or steam on the other side, because this is a double acting engine, which the steam has pushed down on this side, it comes out this and goes into the exhaust port and up the stack, and that's what gives you the choo-choo sound. So what happens in actual operation that this thing slides back and forth like this? Hence the name slide valve. Now there is a mechanism out here, which we'll get into later, which is called a valve gear, which will tell you what makes this thing slide back and forth. <coughs> There's some design work that goes into this called lap and lead and angle of advance and all that, but we're going to get to that in a minute, so don't think we're going to leave it out. Is there anyone who doesn't really understand what's happening? This thing slides back alternately from one side to the other <coughs> over top of these ports. When it's over in this position here, it's closed this one off, but this one is open. <coughs> this valve cannot control the speed, though, can it? This, it controls the speed in this respect that uh, it admits the steam to it, but as the pressure is what controls the speed. Pressure is the As the throttle is open, the pressure gets greater and greater, and more quantity will go into this. The more quantity goes in, the more push it has to go down into the piston, and the faster it pushes the piston back and forth. So you need another valve for the That's back up here in the cab someplace. Right. We'll get to that one later. Now, this is known as a slide valve. It's generally used with engines that have saturated steam. When we get into borders, we'll find out what saturated steam is. There is another type of valve. And it looks a little different. It's called a piston valve. And the reason is, is because it's shaped like a piston. It's round. It has rings on it. The flat D valve has no rings on it. One advantage of the flat D valve is it's relatively easy to make. It's relatively easy. Upside down. How about that? It's relatively easy to make, and it's also easy. Well, I can see it. <laughs> it's also easy to make steam tight. 
piston valves have to be fitted up more closely. They have piston rings on them. It's the rings, as in a piston on the engine, which seals the thing off. As there's a saying, slide valves wear in, piston valves wear out. And to a degree, this is true. It, it's hard to find, if the valve has been reasonably fitted up, the slide valve, in its beginning, it's reasonably lapped in, unless it gets scored on the seat, it'll probably last forever. It'll wear in, but it doesn't really wear itself to the point where it's leaking. Slide valves that have a, a longevity which is built into it. The piston valve is different in this respect. The steam comes in and you'll notice it goes down through here and up through an annular ring of ports that are in a circle like this around the valve. It's what is known as an inside admission valve. The other valve that you saw was an outside admission. The pressure was around the outside of the valve. Here the pressure is on the inside of the valve. It comes down through here, goes around through these annular ports, down into the cylinder. While the exhaust comes up through the annular ports and goes out here. There is an advantage to the piston valve. The steam passages here are much shorter, and you have less chance of cooling off with a piston valve than you do with a slide valve. Because the slide valve, the porting is in the center of the cylinder, and you have to have long ports to run to either end. The piston valve does not. The ports are on the end, and the ports are much, the passages are much shorter, so there's less chance of condensation. This thing actually just changes position, comes over here like this, comes up around here, out to here. This is known as an inside admission valve. The other one is known as an outside admission valve. Now it does make a difference when we get onto the valve here, because whether it's an inside or an outside admission valve, it does change the way the valve here is hooked up. Are there any questions about what a piston valve is or a slide valve? Got that out. Now, valve gears. Well, there's probably as many valve gears to talk about as there were locomotive designers, because it seems sooner or later, almost every locomotive designer came up with some sort of a valve gear to slide this thing back and forth. Some of the most com more common ones that we'll run into, Stevenson which I'll draw you a picture of here after I give you a little history on it. Stevenson valve gear, and this is funny how things work out, came from the company of Robert Stevenson who was building locomotives back in 1843 in Britain. However, with a lot of things, Stevenson didn't really invent it. There was a young man kid, if you want to call him that, working on a drafting board, and he came up with the idea, a fellow by the name of William Williams, and there was a pattern maker by the name of William, William Howell, and they got together and worked out all the details, but when the valve gear came out, Stevenson got the credit. So it's known as the Stevenson valve gear. You have a center shaft like this. <coughs> We're going to put an eccentric. That's the high point of the eccentric.
wheels start to turn, but somebody must be pushing it because nothing is happening. This little block doesn't move. It just kind of rocks back and forth like this. But now, if you drop this drop this leg down to like this. Now this is dropped down where this link is moving back and forth this way. You can see it's going to move that valve back and forth this way. But this is moving in the opposite direction because it's controlled by this opposite eccentric back here. So if you took this move this up here, it would take its motion from this bottom eccentric here instead of the top one here. This link is controlled by a pivot pin in the center. And there's a link that comes up to a lifting link, to a bell crank, which goes back into the cab. This link is lifted up and down by that. This little die block stays in the center here. Whichever, if this is lifted up in the air, it's taking its motion from the backward eccentric, because one eccentric is sent for the engine to run backward. If it's dropped down here, it's taking its motion from the forward eccentric, and so the engine will run forward. We'll show you what happens when that goes. Are there any questions about how the Stevenson valve here works? You said when the, the, the link is up, it takes the motion from the bottom? That's right. And the reason that is is because, and it's just when you stop to think about it, if anything breaks on the valve here, the engine was running forward, which it runs most of the time. If a link would break or a pin would shear or anything like that, that link would drop immediately. Now, if one side dropped and the other side was still up, part of the engine would run around backwards and part of it would run around forward. If they both dropped, you might be going 60 miles an hour and suddenly your engine is running 60 miles an hour in reverse. It could be disastrous. The Stevenson link motion was probably used, well, I would say up in this country to around the early 1900s. Locomotives got bigger and heavier again, and this is mechanism is all set in between the frames. It's difficult to work on, believe me, I know it. It's difficult to work on because it's hard to get at. For that reason, as engines got bigger and heavier, they decided to use what they called an outside radio gear. However, for our miniatures, there's another little type of valve gear, which is relatively simple. <clears throat> Most people have forgotten about. This is the shaft, <coughs> crank shaft, or axle shaft. This is the position of the crank on here. And then we went down through that section again. We took a section right down through the center of the locomotive. This is that business about the eccentric. Now, as you turn this around, you see how if something was fixed to here, it would move back and forth. See this? Just like that. This big yellow thing moving around here. That's an eccentric. Now, there is a valve here, as I said, called the loose eccentric which is ideal for small models. <coughs> Actually, it was used in full-size practice once, and I'm not sure how they reversed it. You let it crawl under the locomotive and gave the thing a push in the opposite direction. There's a pin in the eccentric. This blue piece here is called a stop collar. It is fastened to the, to the axle. Now, when you're running 
like this we are now, we're running backwards, like this, see, we're backing the engine up. This is pushing against that pin, and it's operating the valve here. The axle shaft is turning this collar, eccentric is working, and the engine is backing up. So you stop, and you want to go forward. The eccentric is held in position by a strap, can't move, and you back the engine up with your feet. This comes around like this, hits this pin, the engine will now run forward. And if you stop and you want to back up, you put down your feet again, give the engine a little push in the reverse direction, this thing swings around to here, and you will back up. Now, LBSC said that this is the only type of valve gear that will give you exactly the same event in both forward and reverse. There is no difference. All other valve gears have a little error in them. It's a mechanical impossibility not to have an error in them. Now, it may not be enough that you can tell what it is, but it's there. And usually, the valve gear is set in the direction that the engine going to go most of the time, which is forward. And most of the time, you don't notch up a valve gear, and we'll, get, we'll explain that term in a minute, when you're backing up, so it doesn't make that much difference. If you want to build a small locomotive, regardless of what scale it is, and you want it simple, and you want it easy to maintain, and you don't want it to give you a lot of trouble, and you want to get it done, this is a good valve gear. There are some defects in it. One is that you have to give the engine a little nudge to the rear or to the forward if you want to go. And I think the worst thing about it is you come into the station on a hill and you don't have a good set of brakes, the engine rolls maybe just a few inches backward, and you grandly open the throttle and back up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it is relatively simple to build. There are only two eccentrics. One for each cylinder, and two stop collars. Very few pieces, and if you case harden them or use good material, they will run for years with no attention. So it does, and it does have the disadvantage, if you're a scale-minded individual, that you have to give your engine a little nudge to the rear or to the forward, whichever way you want to go. But once you're running in that direction, it doesn't make any difference. Also, you cannot shorten the cutoff. I have not explained what that is, but it, you'll see what a, perhaps, a defect that would be. Are there any questions about how this little rascal works? Yes, sir, Jay? Do any of the members of the club have locomotives with that? I have one. I have one. I'll tell you what, and Larry has one. And Larry has one, and Mike Kane now has one, too. Uh, I originally built Titch with uh, Walsher's valve here. And it ran very well. Now it had one serious mechanical defect. The wheels on Titch are only two inches in diameter. The height of the railhead was almost three quarters of an inch. And our track was anything but desirable. It was not very good. It had a lot of mm -hmm -hmm to it. In the early days, of, there were frequent derailments. On a Wall Street valve here, which we'll get into that in a few minutes, there is an eccentric crank that inscribes a circle. And unfortunately, when Titch derailed and went down in between the rails, this circle was such that it came around and hit the railhead. And so every time you had a derailment, your engine was out of time. Plus the fact that this was keyed onto the crank pin and it broke the key. So every time you had a derailment, it was a major repair. And the engine ran well, but this was a constant bit of annoyance. So I changed it to Moose Century. That was 40 years ago. We never had any trouble with it. it it's never been taken off. Of course, Titch hasn't run much in the past 10 years, but, but uh, for 30 years, it had a lot of running never been taken off, it's never been taken up, the pins have never been replaced, and it still runs, runs well. 
So it is a kind of a trouble-free unit. Yeah? The, the yellow eccentric, is yeah. that fixed to the axle? It's loose on the axle. Now, now, it does stick in position because remember, you've got an eccentric follower around here, which if you rotate the axle and the eccentric will slip on the axle, it'll hold the eccentric okay. in position. So, so the blue eccentric is fixed? Yeah, this is called a stop collar. Okay, the stop collar is fixed. That's, that's fixed oh. us usually in the miniature size <laughs> by set screw. It's easy to set, it's easy to make, it runs for a long period of time. Yeah? The, uh, you mean this one? Yes. That's the stop collar. It's a stop collar. Yeah. Is that fixed on both sides of the same relationship to each other, or are they at 90 degree angles? You mean here? Right. How would it be fixed on the other side of the engine? Would it be at 90 degree angles to that one? Cornered on the other side. I'm not. I, I, how about it? Timing. Well, timing. 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 With the, with the relationship between these two? No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 the right. other one on the other side. Right. You set this according to the, where the crank. You see, your cranks on a locomotive are quartered like this. Yeah. You would set this to make the valve open at the proper time. With <coughs> both cranks going around here. So actually, these would be 90 degrees apart. The same as the cranks on the engine. Okay, that's what I was wondering. 90 degrees plus an angle of advance, which uh, <coughs> this was determined by the designer, which is determined whether this straight line is. As you can see here now, if I made this cut further out here, that would push this pin further out. The angle of advance would increase. If I made the cut further back here when I made this, you see what I'm saying? And I haven't got to the explanation of angle of advance, but that's what would really happen. Yes, they're located 90 degrees apart from each other because you have a set of this on each cylinder. If you had three cylinders, you would have three of them. What's the biggest engine that you've seen now? Invictus, seven and a half inch gauge, Invictus. Uh, <coughs> I'm trying to think. It's really not so much the uh, size of the engine. Well, it is because the larger the engine you have, the, the more cars you pull. If you've only got one or two people, maybe three on an engine, it's not really much of a problem to give it a little push in one direction or the other. But now you have, a, have a two cars, four or five people each car, then it becomes a little bit of a problem to give the engine a push in the opposite direction. If you want to back up. I would say the weight of the train or the load that you're carrying would probably determine whether you wanted to do it. If you had a large 040 that weighed uh, 200 pounds or something like that, it would probably not be practical for you to put a loose eccentric on for the simple reason that your train that you're hauling would be too heavy to give a push easy, particularly if we were on a hill. Like at the track at McAllister, you come into the station, you stop, and we'll say that the engine does roll back a little bit, so it wants to back up. If you had five people behind you, that's almost a thousand pounds, 200 pounds a person. You'd have to inch that maybe three or four inches up the hill with your feet off of the car. It might be a little bit of a problem. Uh, yes? I have a full scale locomotive. on the eccentrics, and those eccentrics are, I'd say, close to 12, 13 inches in diameter. And they're about that wide. So they're big. They're heavy. They're a key to the shaft. You can't get them off without taking the wheels off. 
They, they aligned them by keyways and mathematics, and they put them in there, and that's where they're going to stay. They're keyed to the shaft, and they're tight. They've never been taken off. Uh, a bronze eccentric strap, and since Jay asked that question, I'll draw it here in a little bit bigger. Talk about lubrication, and this is one of the problems with Stevenson gear. There's a lot of pieces to keep oiled up. Those eccentrics are about this big around. And of course, they're set here like this. There is a eccentric strap, which Joe Nelson says you shouldn't make, but everybody does. Why did you say? Well, I'll tell you in a second here. That's the shaft in section. This sex, this piece in the center here is the eccentric. Can you see this? Is eccentric. This is the eccentric strap that goes around here. Now, if this wears, you can take this apart and take a little piece of metal off of there, see? There are shims in there for wear. You pull the shims out and then bolt it back together and that squeezes it up tight. Now, admittedly, that does not make a perfect circle. I mean, I think somebody said that's not a perfect, but in practically, it's the way you take the stake out. But on the front end of this, originally, there was a little oil cup there, full of wicking, and you reached in there with a long oil can and put some oil in there. Well, oil doesn't stick like grease does. So, a few years ago, an ex cinder sniffer member, Dick Carmel, for example, took, screwed in a fitting, this is much thicker here, screwed in a fitting, put a rubber hose that comes out, attaches to the frame, with a grease fitting on you stick a grease gun up there and, and it greases. See, there's goes into here like this, and the grease gets carried all the way around. But back in 1850, they probably didn't use that. They probably used the oil cup and reached in there and used oil on it. There's wicking in there, which the oil will run through and gradually run in. But we found that the oil has also a tendency to run off. And it's much better if you use the grease. They get taken up, I think, once about every three years, something like that. Well, I was thinking a locomotive that was going across country back in the mid-1800s would have to stop periodically and move. Every couple hours. Every time you, if you were running on a transcontinental trip like that, about every time you stopped to take water, which is about every hour and a half to two hours along the way, or maybe two or three hours. I'm sure the engineer was out there with the oil cans for an oil in there. Yeah. Lubrication was a problem. We talked about something, and I was using the term about valve lap. And I think I should explain what valve lap is because I'm sure that's a steam port. Steam is up here in the steam chest, twirling around, and wants to get down in here wants to go down into the cylinder like this, but we got it blocked off. In early steam locomotives, they didn't understand the thing that we talked about at the last get-together, which was how much energy is really stored up in the steam. Remember all those BTUs that we crammed in there, over a thousand in there, and they were all anxious to go to work. Each one of them had lift 778 pounds a foot high in the air. So what they did, they thought all they had to do was open and shut this valve, this little port here, and that was all they had to do. Well, 
So they did. They made a vow, which is like this. And they just spanned that portal. <coughs> There's another portal over here. They just spanned that portal. They thought that they had to admit steam through the entire length of this piston stroke that we got down here. They thought that you had to put steam in here and you had to admit it for that piston to run all the way down to here. And that's the way they did it. There's only one trouble with that. It's expensive. And the engines in those days quite frequently had to stop and get up steam again because they used so much steam, because they emitted steam for the full length of the stroke. Well, it was Watt, believe it or not, who discovered that if you cut the steam off about here, we'll say 50 or 60 percent of the stroke, there's enough heat energy in those BTUs we talked about to keep pushing that piston down. <coughs> Even though you shut the steam off from admission. Now it doesn't push as hard as it did when it had water pressure on it, but it's pushing hard enough to make it work. So, they found out that by increasing the width of the valve here, and they called it lap. They found out that by increasing the valve width over the port, they could shut the steam off before this piston got all the way down to the other end. And in doing so, they were able to use less fuel and they were able to keep steam pressure up. The engine, engine ran better. It actually ran smoother that way. And if it hadn't been for that, I'm afraid the steam engine would have disappeared from the American scene long ago. <laughs> because this is the thing that made it possible to be useful in engine. Now, most, there is a, a ratio of which, I don't know whether Larry Kale still has a computer program or not, but there is a ratio that if you have the port, the relation of the port Plus, it'll give you the dimension there, what you should make that. For every percent of cutoff from, I don't know, from zero, from zero to 100%. And one I always remember, because it's easy. If you have a port that's one inch, and you make the lap one inch, that makes a section that's two inches there, the cutoff is automatically 75%. That means that the steam is admitted to this piston pushing down in this or this direction for 75% of the stroke. Cuts off about down in here. It'll shut off. There is, most locomotives, cutoffs run between 75 and 85%. And because most miniature engines run in full gear all the time, that's full stroke. Uh, 75 to 80 percent is plenty. If you've got a boiler that keeps up with an 85 percent cutoff, you've got a, either a very good boiler or off a small cylinder. I have a question. Yes, sir. Does the cutoff for cut off, notching up. <coughs> Let's go back to this piston again. The steam is admitted here round numbers, if you, this is halfway down, right here, if the 
fist that came down right to here and stopped. I don't mean the piston stopped, the valve shut the steam off. This is a 50% cutoff. If it stopped down here, another 25% further, that's a 75% cutoff. By cutoff, it means that there is no more steam being admitted to the cylinder for boiler pressure. The steam that's in there is pushing. It's not pushing as hard as it was on the boiler, but it is pushing. To give you an example of how much it loses, though, there's a formula. That's how you can find the indicated horsepower of a steam engine. P is the pressure. L is double the length of stroke in feet. This is for a single cylinder engine, so you have to multiply by two on a locomotive. Area is the area of the piston in square inches. And N is the number of revolutions per minute. And 33,000 is this magical figure <coughs> that James Watt came up with to figure out what a horsepower was, which is 33,000 pounds lifted one foot in one minute. That's a horsepower. Now P is the catch. You can't use boiler pressure because you cut it off halfway down or three quarters of the way down. So what you do, and this is a rule of thumb thing, which again works out very close to being what it actually is, for P, you use one half water pressure. One half the water pressure. That is called, pressure is what they call mean effective pressure, which is the average of what this thing pushes through the whole length of the stroke. It starts out at about 0.85 of the boiler pressure, and you cut it off at, we'll say, 50% or 75% down in there, it actually it averages out about half the boiler pressure by the time it gets to the bottom. Is that area of the solar in inches or square, square inches? inches yeah. Square inches, yeah, square inches. But it's double the length of stroke in feet. And that stroke is a total stroke, not yeah. In feet. So if you had an engine that had a one foot stroke on a single cylinder because it's double acting, you would say it had two there. Incidentally, about that PLAN business, at zero RPM there is no horsepower developed because if you multiply and divide the formula out, if you multiply by zero, you get nothing. So, at, horsepower has an element of time in it. Horsepower is time. Horsepower and torque have nothing to do with each other. The engine can be developing 50 tons of torque at this time, but it could have 100,000 pounds tractive force, but it isn't developing any horsepower because it isn't moving. Horsepower only applies to a moving thing. If the thing isn't moving, there's no horsepower. What would that equation give you? What would that give you? What, what does that equal? I'll write it again. P, L, A, N. And incidentally, we're going to give you all these formulas in a little printed sheet. This is indicated I say it's indicated horsepower is that there's another actual horsepower output rating which they don't use on locomotives which is brake horsepower which is the actual output of the engine. This does not take into account any friction or anything like that. It is an indication of how much horsepower this machine will develop. You, 
can figure it out and say, well, it's 100 horsepower, it might actually produce 140 horsepower, it might produce only 75 horsepower. There's a lot of unknowns in there. This does give you an idea <coughs> of what the engine will do. So, we don't want to sit too long. We'll be okay. next time. Okay. Your, your name was Greg? Glad to have you with us, Greg. Uh, we were talking about Stevenson valve here. There's a little bit of difference in some of the Stevenson parts, and I'll show you this because you might run into it. <coughs> On this curved link, of link is known as a locomotive link. This type of link Link. The one on the right is known as the launch type link, and I think you can readily see the difference. In this one, the travel of the eccentric must be greater than what the valve travels, because you're inboard of this pivot point in the center here. And on this one, it's about the same. The reason they went to this one is because of long travel valves in which they were increasing the lap on the valve has to travel more because here's the formula to find out how much the valve has to travel. Two times the port opening plus lap. <coughs> that's not toe, that's port opening. Two times the port opening plus the lap will give you the valve travel. So if the Port will just use one because it's easy. If the port opening was at one inch and the lap was one inch, that would be two times two. The valve would travel four inches. In order to get the <coughs> how far do I have to make it off the center to make it travel? If you stay away from things like heat transfer and you do some simple layouts, you don't have to be a mathematical genius to make a good end. So don't let all of these formulas you see in the books scare you to death because you don't really have to do this. If you were making a big engine of six or eight or 9,000 horsepower or whatever you wanted, yeah, you would. But as long as we stick with in our sizes, we can handle it pretty much with dime store arithmetic. <coughs> On a Stevenson valve here, we'll go back to that again. center shaft here, and here is the crank out here. This is the thing that goes around that. Whether it's 
inside as a crank or outside as a crank pin. It still does the same thing. We'll do this in sections. This is centric. Stop shaking. I try to help it to shake. Like a hot tail? Yeah. <laughs> this is centric. Leads this by 90 degrees. Plus angle of advance. Plus the angle of advance. Now why the angle of advance? Well remember that when I told you about the old steam ports in which the top of the valve just covered the steam port, well if you made everything that way it would be just exactly 90 degrees that that eccentric would lead the crank. But, remember, you've got that thing called lap on a valve. Now you have to twist the eccentric ahead of that crank until you just begin to open the port when this pin is in the position it's in. This is called the angle of advance. Now that moves the lap distance in an angular fashion. But, there's a thing called lead. And lead is when a piston is on dead center, like this, that valve is just starting to open. Now, how much do you do this in a miniature? Well, we won't, all the books we can talk about full size practice. It may be up to as much as eighth of an inch. But I would say on most miniature engines, anything from five to 15,000, that's between 5 thousandths of an inch and 15 thousandths of an inch, which is a 64th of an inch. It's kind of one of those little weenie marks on a scale. Actually, if you look at it with a magnifying glass, it looks much bigger than it really is, so don't let that fool you either. But you can check with a feeler gauge, stick it down between the port and the valve, and you check it. I would say from five to 15 thousand feet. And why does it vary? Because the steam passages are different sizes because the valve is a different size and there is no hard and fast rule that you can give somebody to say, this is what it should be set. Actually, I thought I was pretty smart when I redid Susan. I thought I'll give it 15,000 lead. Well, it didn't seem to run as well as it should, so I cut the lead down to 5,000 and it ran a lot better. So here again. But then I have set other engines with a 15,000 lead and they ran very well. It's something you got to kind of play with it. Is there anybody who doesn't understand when I'm talking about lead? This? The lead? The lead? Okay, we'll look, we'll look at the steam chest from the top. Or maybe use your model. <laughs> use what? Your, oh, that? Well, we can use that to make it a little clearer. We'll use this little booger over here. He said, what's lead? See this? Like this? The valve is in mid position. See that? All right. When you move the crank around to top dead center or forward dead center or back dead center, the valve will be in this position here. Now, this, this is on back dead center. The crank is on back dead center because that's towards the tail end of the engine. See that? That port is closed. So we're going to give it some lead. So we move the eccentric like this. Now with the piston on back dead center, that port is just starting to open. <coughs> That's lead. And I would say on a miniature engine between five and 15 thousandths of an inch. It's one of those things you can play with. You do have to take off the top of the sheen chest covers because you can't look through them. That is, unless you're smart enough, as some people are, to drill little holes in the side of the steam chest and tap little holes in there so you can look in there without taking it apart. Would the lead be then used to keep it, it stuck on top of that center? 
No, actually, in this case, lead is a hindrance because when you're opening on top dead center, it's not doing anything. Remember, it takes time for steam to go down through here. And that's why if you had excessive lead and it was exactly on center, if you opened it up, nothing would happen because it's on dead center, it won't move. However, the other side is gonna move it. So lead gives you that little bit of time for the steam to come through and go down through here. Now, steam travels pretty fast. You'd be amazed how fast it travels down the pipe. So you don't want too much. If you get too much, you'll find that it's pushing, it's giving it a oof, oof, like that. When it comes over the top dead center, this would be open too much and there would be too much steam admitted in there. Uh, to draw a line that you're most familiar with, it's like advancing the spark on an infernal combustion engine. Did that answer your question, Dave? That answers it pretty well. And again, the lap is the width of that. This is the lap right here. Right, the excess. That's width. right. It's the extra amount <clears throat> of port cover is what it amounts to. Whether it be piston valve or whether it be slide valve, it's the extra amount of port covering. This is known as the lap. So if you're going to adjust your, you're going to take material off or add it to the slide valve, on, on the lead, you're not going to fool around with your ports or the spacing. No, you don't change. The ports, the ports are milled into the cylinder. The only reason for changing them, I think, is that unfortunately you have made a horrible error in something and you have to correct that. But normally, if you put the ports even close to where they should be, and you make the valve to fit the ports. You might give me a little tip on that too, is to use an expression of which most slide valves and piston valves are set. Purposes of explanation, we'll stick with the slide valve. These are the ports in the top here. This has got section lines in it, this has got section lines. This goes down to the piston, and this comes away from the piston. This is the exhaust here. The valve, when it's set, this is known as line on line. Now, it's all valves of lap. <laughs> this line here, the inside of this, matches this line here. So, what you're going to do is measure your cylinder. That's right. Valve. That's right. You can make it in, in case you have made a mistake. We'll say you yeah, never make a mistake. An error. Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you can match the valve to whatever you have. And unless it's really out, you can make it work pretty well. Probably if you don't tell anyone, you'll never know it. Now, this is known as lap here. And this engine designer that I spoke of, which I have great admiration for, did something to his valve. He gave him exhaust clearance. In other words, this dimension in here, <coughs> on the valve, he added about a 64th of an inch. Now, in adding that 64th of an inch, he gave what is known as an early release to the exhaust coming out of the cylinder. And he did that for a very good reason. In a small locomotive, it's important that the boiler works at its maximum efficiency all the time. I mean, it really has to go like gangbusters, because you're only talking about a little pot about that long in most cases. He gave it exhaust clearance here. And what happened is that engines developed what they called, and it was very noticeable, and if you've ever run behind an engine that was designed by LBSC, you can hear it right away. It was called the LPSC chomp, because that's the way exhaust came out. Bam! With a crack like that. And it went up the stack like gangbusters. And this created a very heavy draft. And the boiler, by creating a very heavy draft, 
he was able to generate more steam than he lost by opening up the exhaust port too soon. So you're saying the exhaust clearance results a little in the increase? In that's the right. It increases the draft. Now, normally, most designers say line on line. But if you really want to boost the output of the boiler and force it a little bit, you give it just a little bit of exhaust clearance, the, the stack will change its tone. And you can tell by that that you're getting a sharper blast out of there. The draft will increase. And in all probability, if the boiler is reasonably designed in every other way, the amount that you lose by giving it exhaust clearance, you will gain more by the output in steam. Now remember, we're not talking mechanical efficiency or, or thermal efficiency. We're talking about power output. And that's what you want in a miniature engine. You don't burn enough fuel to worry about the price of it. What you want is maximum power if you can get it. And this is one way to get it. If you want to experiment with it a little, it helps sometimes. So you would make the valve gap there between the legs and the teeth greater? Yeah, I wouldn't change this dimension. I'd change this dimension on the valve. You, you make that longer. Longer is yeah. shorter. Longer. longer. If you make it the other way, if you make it the other way, and there have been engines designed that have this in here, which you can see. That is known as exhaust lap, exhaust lap. And what it does, it allows the steam to stay in the cylinder longer. It pushes down further, see? Because it takes longer for this to uncover that port. <coughs> so it does have an effect. And in full-size practice, they did use exhaust glass sometimes. But and, and it, we are getting kind of technical here. This is what happens. This is the piston rod. It goes around like this. Right? OK. You're hanging that exhaust in there. This is at 90 degrees. You're hanging the exhaust in there. Here's the horizontal here. We'll say that, we'll say that with, with the LBSC chomp, that's with exhaust clearance on there, you're releasing the gases about here. All right. Here's where you're releasing them here. <clears throat> Look at the angularity of that rod. See how it's coming up? OK, so you give it exhaust that. Man, we're going to get every little BTU that we can get out of that rascal. So you can't get it much past here. You can see there's very little push being exerted. As you get up beyond this, this rod has very little effect on what it's doing. So if you release it here, you're losing a little mechanical efficiency, but you're not gaining much between here and here. And down here, it's almost nil. Did that answer your question? Yes. Any more questions on that? Well, we were getting into valve here. And we got a couple of them here. And we'll start out with the simple ones first. Because those are the easiest to understand. There was a guy by the name of John Wesley Hackworth back in 1859. The reason I'm showing you this is because he came up with a principle. I have to turn this so you can see it. This is what is known as a Hackworth valve gear. It's what is known as a radial gear, even though it has an eccentric. There's two definitions of a radial gear, which usually applies to outside valve gears. One is says they have no eccentric, which Wall Street and Baker and Southern, they do not have eccentric. They're all radial gear. This one has an eccentric because a lot of times they put it in between the frames on an engine. But there's also another definition of a radial valve gear. It's which some part of the valve gear inscribes an ellipse. Now, you know what an ellipse is. It's an oval. This is an ellipse. 
And that's the way some of the valve gears and scribes are listed. They're not perfect, but they do do that kind of circular motion there. This valve gear was never used on an American locomotive. It was a British design, and it just never found it in favor in this country. But it's a very simple one to make, and it doesn't work too badly. As you will see here, when we start going around in a circle, See how that slider goes up and down? See how this slider goes up and down there? But you'll notice when the slider is going up and down, it's also moving this thing just a little bit back and forth. When it's going up and down like that and the valve is in mid-gear, the valve gear is set in mid-gear, but this is that movement of lap and lead. It's moving the lap and lead all the time. Lap, remember, is that excess that's over the top of the port, and the lead is how much you open the valve of the cylinder, or rather the piston is on forward or backward dead center. See, now this is the center of this section. If you'll draw it out on a piece of paper, is that section that's inscribing an ellipse like this. That's that green circle up here. And that is where it gets its name, although it does use an eccentric. Now, if it's placed on the outside of the locomotive, where you can see it, it uses what is known as an eccentric crank, which I'll show you how that works in a minute. Now, if you want to make this thing go forward, watch this over here. We've got lap and lead here, but we want to go forward. Now, watch how the travel of that thing increases. See now? Now it's opening the port all the way. See that? Just by moving that to this direction here, it makes the valve travel farther because this thing is now traveling up at an angle. Now if you want to reverse it, see how that moves that? And the engine would back up. See that? See that, how that moves when you swivel this back and forth? It makes this valve move back and forth. It's now admitting steam to the opposite side of the piston. And that's how it reverses. The biggest disadvantage of Hackworth gear, and you can get around that in a miniature, very easy. The biggest disadvantage is you can see if the wheels are moving up and down like this, which if they are on springs, they're moving up and down, it would change the valve event because that would make this thing go higher or lower which would make this maybe go way out here or come way back here if the wheel was bouncing up and down. But back to three-point suspension again. In a miniature, you can fix the rear axle solid as long as you're working with a small engine. You can fix it solid, you can cross equalize in front, and you can use the Hackworth valve gear and you don't have to worry about the wheels going up and down. Now there's another way to get around it too in case you would want to use it. Take it and turn it like this. Like this. And you can hook a bell crank to here, a lever up here to a bell crank, and run the valve here like this. So this thing is moving forward. So actually, any up and down movement like this would be almost have no effect on the gear at all. However, I will say this. It was never, as far as I can tell, ever used on an American locomotive. And the reason I would use it to illustrate it, because Southern valve gear uses this same principle of throwing a point over top of center and making it reverse. Baker didn't invent that. Hackworth did in 1859. Baker gear was merely an application of Hackworth's principle. He patented the gear, but he didn't patent the idea. The idea was this, moving the point over center like this, and that's what makes it reverse. Now this valve gear was used quite a bit on traction engines, and for the life of me, I cannot find why the traction engine people call it the wolf gear. Because I've looked at pictures of the wolf gear, and it's exactly the same as the Hackworth, but they call it the wolf. And I've never found a traction engine expert who can give me a decent reason why it is. They just say, well, it's the wolf gear.
but it isn't really. It's the hack word here. I don't know why they call it a wolf. Are there any questions about this simplified valve here? Yes. See, it wasn't affected much by the wheel source. Yeah. Very little. Almost nothing at all. <laughs> it would be it would be a lie to say that it was not affected because the wheels are moving up and down. But it's I would say for practical application, no. You had a question, Terry? Yeah, just You're just stretching. I'm stretching. Okay. Long, long hair question. You said that was ever used on American motor motor. What kind of use? It was used. Uh, it was originated in Britain, of course. They used it uh, in a lot of foreign export. Britain built a lot of locomotives for Java, South Africa. Little small contractors engine. Were they simple parts? They wanted it cheap. Uh, there were some German engines that used it, a uh, little small, a little industrial, a little switch engine. Uh, how did they get away from the problem with the wheel moving up and down affecting the gear, or didn't they worry about it? They didn't worry about it. <laughs> That's how they got rid of it. Yes? I vaguely recall seeing that either on a, I think it was a, a quarter engine or a white quarter engine sitting on display out in Salida, Colorado. Was it? Was it originally made for Colorado, or was it made for export and got back here? I, I think it was an American. It was an American. Made locomotive. Now I don't know what about the engines that are on the Triple Three Breaker. Some of those are some of those were German. yeah. Some German of those made. were German, and some of them were actually used in South America, and they bought them and shipped them up here. And, and uh, I believe they one of the other had had one. It could be. I just never. I just yeah. never. the word which uh, we were going to talk about compounding while we're talking about steam engines and cylinders we may as well talk about this in future still free remember at the last meeting we said that almost 50 percent of the heat that you put into the firebox went up the stack and going choo this is a fact of life and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, there is something you can do about it. You can take a piston of such size you can exhaust steam in the atmosphere <coughs> or and this is giant over Throwing all that heat into the atmosphere, you can use it again. Now, the word simple in steam engine doesn't mean that it's simple. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's mechanically simple. What it means is that it uses its steam once, just once, and then bluey, it's gone. When you compound an engine, you use it twice times and sometimes even four times. So what you do is the steam is coming into here and the exhaust steam is going out here. And to save money and get a little more power, we'll take this exhaust steam and run it down into here. <coughs> now it's true, most of the oomph has gone out of that steam. A good part of it not nearly as lively as it was, but it is lively. And if you put it in a bigger cylinder, I'd say one that has twice the diameter, there's enough push in there to make it a useful engine. You can gain about 30% to 35% increase in power by compound, which is saving steam. You take it out of the high pressure cylinder, this is known as the HP, and this is the LP. You put it in there, and then in railway locomotives, because no one, I don't think, I'm pretty sure of this, has ever really devised a good air condenser. I mean a really good air condenser. 
compares to the one Dick Taylor uses because he pulls out a few million gallons of water a day out of the Ohio River. Water is a good coolant, but air is, as far as steam is concerned. There were 25 locomotives in South Africa that were the most recent, and they were back in the late 70s and 80s, in which they were compound and condensing, and they used an air condenser. It worked so well that these events, these engines, before they were scrapped, were all converted to let the condenser go. They just got rid of it. Condensing is where you take the steam out of this side, run it back to a series of pipes or a container, and it goes from a gas back into the water. Like that. Back into water, and then it's pumped back into the water again same water over and over and over and over, except that there's always leaks and little drips here and there, and so you have what you call makeup, and you have to keep on adding to it. You can gain about 30 to 35 percent power. It's kind of funny how people are set in their thinking, too. For example, in this country, we made compounds, and Generally speaking, the compounds were made in what they called the drag era, when the epitome of a locomotive was how much it could start, and if it didn't get about 25 or 30 miles an hour, that was okay. It could pull all of outdoors. So we started out with little cylinders like this and making big compound cylinders, and then we wanted bigger locomotives, so we made a little bit bigger high-pressure cylinders and bigger cylinders here, and then we wanted bigger locomotives, so we made a bigger high-pressure cylinder, and these things got to be enormous. Some of them got to be four feet in diameter. Well, this is okay, and it works better on paper than it actually works. And the problem with it is, is weight. In the cylinder, you can see right now, counterbalancing, and yet counterbalancing is the back, the art of taking one weight and counteracting the forces of another weight, particularly in a rotating fashion. The weights in these huge cylinders, the pistons, the crosshead, the connecting rods, were so enormous that the counterweights on the engine had to be so huge to keep this thing from bang, 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 bang. And besides, they could only run about 30 miles an hour because they were so big and heavy. They developed lots of power. Boy, they could shove all outdoors and go right through a brick wall easy. But they were heavy. And so when freight train speeds got in, you notice I didn't say passenger. When freight train speeds begin to pick up, and fuel in this country was a little bit cheaper than it was any place else in the world, and we had lots of it, and we didn't mind wasting it, we went to higher pressures, smaller cylinders, and put more of them on there and got rid of these big babies out here, which was okay. Like the big boy was one of the most powerful locomotives ever built, and it had four high-pressure cylinders on it. And they say big boy was counterbalanced for about 75 miles an hour, which for a machine that's pretty good. But I really think the epitome of efficient steam engine design rested in mon ami en français, a man by the name of André Champon, which you may have heard of, took an engine, which was a simple expansion engine, 2,500 horsepower. And these things were kind of badly worn. And he rebuilt this engine using his own ideas. And he made what they called four-cylinder balanced compound, which there were two high-pressure cylinders, and there were two low-pressure cylinders. You notice they're not too big either. By doing this, he increased the horsepower a thousand horsepower a 
and he didn't use much more coal. And his balance compound would run on passenger trains at 90 miles an hour. And it's a shame that with all our resources that we didn't pursue this form of engineering. However, it came probably too late in the game. The diesel was already on the horizon, and it was too easy to call General Motors and order a free diesel. But in this country, how, what I meant to say is we get to thinking like this. We look down a tunnel, and sometimes you find that the other people throughout the world, maybe, you know, they, they did have some good ideas. I really think that the best high-speed compounds, without a doubt, were the French locomotives. I don't think anything could equal them as far as speed and economy. Was that on a rigid frame? Yeah. The 482. Wheel arrangement. He took an engine that was kind of ho hum and rebuilt it. So those four cylinders are all in the same yeah. assembly, right? Why did he do it? How did he do it? Uh, high pressure? You need <coughs> valves or what? He had two high pressure cylinders and two low pressure cylinders. And they were very well balanced. What he did is demonstrate that, see, we always thought that compounding big engines, big slow sloggers, which was okay. But he operated on the other principle, that compounding could be made to run fast. And it did run fast. They used them on their passenger express train. And they, they were very good. simple little device which you may want to use sometime. See how this is inscribing? See that ellipse that this is inscribing here? This is that ellipse that I was telling you about. Now it's not a perfect one, but it is making a swing. And it is an ellipse, but it doesn't do the same part all the time. The top and the bottom are different. See this? Notice how this is moving. It's moving in between these sections on right here. That's your lap and lead. This motion, this elliptical motion, imparted to this bell crank, and now lap is not an angular function, but it's a linear function. All right, now we want to go forward. So we take this. We move this point. See how we're moving this point here? Now watch how it increases the travel. See that? How it increases the travel? See how far that bell crank is moving? Now I'll move it back to mid gear. See how the travel shortens? See how it's not traveling as much as it was? Now we want to reverse it. Okay, so we'll put it in the back like this. See that bell crank move there? And you move it back and forth. This is the point that's moving. It moves over this center point here. See that? That's the same principle on which that Hackworth gear works. That's also the same principle that the southern valve gear works. They do it with a curved link on top, but if you look at it, it's the moving of the point over center and the end of this rod up here on the southern gear does exactly the same elliptical motion that this does. About the only difference between the two is that you have a curved link here on top of the southern gear, which again is harder to make. I saw this on one locomotive at the track, and that was when this young man by the name of Yoder came down with that little engine he had little engine that ran so well, it does have the Smith valve here on it. And it works very well, incidentally. If you wanted an easy valve here to make, it's got one, two, three, four pieces in a frame, five pieces, and all the wear points are pins and bearings. There are no curved links. Is there any question about how this works? Southern and everything, what was the advantage you had with curved links? You 
didn't have to have a, a bow gear frame. The curved link occupied, stabilized this part of the gear up here so you didn't have to have a frame for it. This bow gear, which is not shown on this board, must have a frame to support this. Are there any questions on this one? Yes, sir, Charlie. Yeah. How efficient is it? I mean, as far as uh, controlling your lap, uh, controlling your uh, events. How what? How well does it control your events in comparison to, say, a Stevenson? Are there errors in it? Yeah. see this is not a perfect ellipse here. Yeah. See, that's not a perfect ellipse. I would say this, uh, based on what I saw in actual operation, any error, and I watched the engine run both forward and reverse and listen to the sound of it, I would say that, that there isn't enough error in it to make it worth considering. I don't think, I mean, that's my own opinion. I don't think it's it's enough to bother with. And I think it, uh, some of that would depend upon the fellow who constructed it to build the parts. Also, there is another disadvantage to it, is that you're going to have to sit down and design your own. Because as far as I know, there is not an engine design that I don't know all of, but I know use a Smith valve here that you can say, oh, I want to build this 4A2 or something over here with Smith valve here. You would have to design it for your engine. However, it is not difficult to design. Uh, I did it for the one I was doing for Model Tech. As a matter of fact, this valve here is double the size of the one that was to be used on that engine. It doesn't take too long to lay it out. It's kind of a cut and try method unless you want to use a lot of mathematical calculations and actually I think the cut and try method once you start scribing a few circles here and there you instantly see how it's going to work and then it's just a question of wearing out the errors. It isn't exactly a five minute job but it, it's not a year or two or anything like that. Now Carl. You mentioned model tech, why don't you just do anything? Yeah, Carl says why don't I do that? For those of you who subscribe to Model Tech, uh, it will continue in publication. Uh, a former editor of Live Steam Magazine, George Broad, uh, bought Model Tech, and uh, he is now going to continue to publish it in St. Clair, Minnesota. Matter of fact, the schedule was right. He picked up everything today and took it to St. Clair. So Model Tech will continue. Doris will produce one more issue, which is the February, and part of the March, George will actually issue the March issue. He will take charge of publication. He is now the owner, editor, publisher, whatever else he has to do. George was editor of Live Steam Magazine when the cliche ran in 77 to about, uh, well, he, he was he went in as editor about 76, 1976, Live Steam Magazine, and he was editor until about uh, 79, I think. So he was editor for three years. Uh, George did all the drawings, and he's a very good draftsman. He's a very good writer. Uh, he has a good eye for publication. Questions about this? We have one more to talk about. This is probably the most famous. was designed and Gottfried's got another name for this. What do they call it in Germany? Heusinger. 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 I don't know. 
I don't know what Heusinger means in German, but I know that Walshert was a Belgian, I think. Well, anyway, he did it for Belgian State Railway in the far off year of 1844. And it did not immediately find favor. Not immediately. As a matter of fact, it was not used on a locomotive in this country until 1876, when Mason made one for the Denver and Rio Grande, or Denver, South Park, and Pacific, uh, called the Mason Bogey Engine, which they kind of did it unusual way because the Mason Bogey Engine, the trucks swiveled on the buggy, and the cylinders moved like an articulated mallet, and they used the Walshert gear, and they had the valve gear over the top of the boiler hanging down, which raised and lowered the link on it. It was kind of a weird arrangement, but, but it did work. And that engine was used for a number of years uh, with varying degrees of success, I might add. But this valve gear was, has probably found itself on more locomotives <coughs> than any other single type of gear. Uh, if you can say it has disadvantages, it has a lot of parts has a curved link, which again is more trouble to make than not having a curved link. But it does perform well, and I've heard professional engineers say, well, an engine that has a wall shirt gear has a lot more snap than an engine that does not have a wall shirt gear. Uh, in my limited experience, I never could tell the difference. <laughs> so I guess maybe it, maybe it has, and maybe there's some emotion. Uh, I'll turn this over slowly. It's set in mid-gear now. This red section down here is the main rod. This is the crosshead, which slides between the bars. This is the piston rod here, the valve rod, and of course the valve slider, which is up here. This curved section is the link, and that's what actually reverses it, is the link. This yellow one here is the radius rod. The gray one here is the bell crank, which you operate from the cab forward or reverse, raise and lower it. The one in this ivory colored one here is known as a combination lever. The little gold one down here is the union link. Now we'll watch it work. As you can see, there's a lot of pieces. Uh, move this to, and I drill my holes in slightly the wrong position. You will notice that when it's in mid gear, there is almost no movement into this radius rod here. See that radius rod? There is movement into the valve rod. That's because the crosshead moves back and forth. And see this combination <coughs> lever here? This is a fixed pivot point now, and that moves that valve rod back and forth. That is where the lap and lead in the wall shirt gear comes from. The lap and lead motion is taken off of the crosshead right here through this union link 